Hey, what's going on, guys? Welcome to a, another episode of Reacts. We've got a special guest today, and you might recognize him, Mr. John Stryker Meyer. What's up, John? Pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invite. Yeah, it's um. Let's react. Yeah, you had to to get a helicopter to use a jungle penetrator to infiltrate you into Utah. That that took a <laughs> lot of coordination. It to, was. To it was horrible. We got there. We got we got here. <laughs> it, what's real cool is um, I you know you take a. Two Green Berets that served in different time periods, uh, John in Vietnam, me in the modern global war on terror, the GWAT. And it's cool because when I look at these photos, I've seen, like, I'm known to have a lot of photos on that guy. But just like I tell everybody, I we didn't have selfies back then. So John didn't take this photo, this, no. this handsome man uh, <laughs> right here. I didn't take my photos. I had somebody on my team that was just... A guy who liked to take photos. Yeah. So fortunate for me, I always had those guys on my team, and so I had a guy that took a picture of me. Let's talk about this photo, John, because on this episode of Reacts, I want to kind of use me as the reaction, looking at the photo, and then ask kind of the context behind it. Sure. Do you remember that day? Clearly. Really? Oh yeah, absolutely. Where's Where's that at? Was well, that FOB one Fubai, and uh, this was uh, in December where uh, we just came back. Our team had been TDY down at the FOB6, and we had to come back because one of our, uh, we had a special mission where the helicopter, the King V, the South Vietnamese Air Force, had gone out and seven Green Berets were lost in one day on a special mission inserting Elder Sun. So we came back and uh, we got back on the team and uh, back in camp, I mean, and we had another mission. We got shot out. We came back. And so we were in camp. And I was there with Lynn Black, who was on Idaho at that time for that mission. Yeah. And, of course, with our South Vietnamese. And they cropped the other guys out. But that's me in front of our indigenous uh, Spike Team Idaho, Team Hooch, at Fubai, FOB1, December 1968. Wow. That's a lot. Man, that's awesome that you re you, you remember that. What? So the the you said six green berets, seven green the berets, seven green berets. Did they die in the in the crash? Yeah, they were en route to insert uh, Elder Sun, which was ammunition that the CIA had reworked, and our job was to insert it into the AO, into enemy caches, leave it on the trail if you're on a mission, and the enemy would pick it up and it would explode when they used it. Yeah, yeah, it's funny because I I kind of. I think I've done that. You have. I, I can't. In I can't a, talk about that. But it's like in another interview. We talked about that. Yeah, off the yeah it's like, a little bit. Well, it's cra it's crazy the the overlap of tactics, techniques, and procedures, and the similarities of special operations working with the CIA and and doing that kind of stuff. Well, and again, here's that continuity factor with the OSS, at least the CIA with SF doing things. Yeah, and of course you had a little time. In the CIA, the, can, yeah. we, can we say CIA? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. I got their approval. I don't know if they approve, <laughs> but I got their approval. So, uh, when let me ask you about the kit because I think a lot of guys and gals who kind of watch this channel are interested in the gear. I, I personally am interested in it. So, I noticed that you have, I, I don't know if they, the nomenclature was the same, but it looks like M67 frags on your top left shoulder, and then you have what appears to be pineapple frags but they're, they don't have the texture are those are those american frags they're all american yeah the the lower one here is the m26 and then these were the new baseball what we call baseball hand grenades and on that day we just put our web gear on because we had done some team profiles earlier because it was december we had rumors that fob1 was going to be shut down uh. as we just said we were forbidden from taking pictures but we said, screw it. We're going to take pictures today. Yeah. So we did some earlier profiles. And at the end of that, we came back to the hooch. Yeah. What's That's, a pro, What's a profile? What does that mean? means... Like a just, train up? No. It's just ego. Oh, like getting your kid on, yeah. taking pictures? Get the kid on. Ooh, I like that. That's why I'm wearing uh, fatigues, because we never wore them on any missions or anything. What do you mean? What do you mean? You never wore that? Jungle fatigue like this, the camouflage? No, not on a mission. Yeah. Because oh, what did you they wear had, on missions? Just regular army fatigues. Oh, we, OG, OGs. 107s or whatever. Whatever they were. But yeah, they yeah. were jungle fatigues, and then we had inserted extra pockets here. Modified them? Uh, modified them. Added four more pockets for everything from morphine to mir uh, to mirrors, things yeah. like that. But these, um, so we had profiled earlier, and that's a team profile with our 
different levels of one zeros of our spike team, Idaho. Yeah. With the same South Vietnamese. We had to rebuild the team. The team was wiped out in the mission in May of 68. We had to rebuild it. Yeah. And then after it was rebuilt, uh, uh, Robert J. Spider Parks was our first one zero. He brought us back with the working with our South Vietnamese counterpart, Sal, yeah. Yeah. who was a South Vietnamese. And he had been running missions for two years, two and a half years. Wow. And Survived all, that long. Is absolutely. Long time, I know. Right? Yeah. And he was just completely fearless. And he was a South Vietnamese. Wow. And they trained him up. So by November, December, we had Buku missions under our belt. Yeah. And I wanted to capture it. Unfortunately, again, somebody else took all these pictures. Wow. So I, I do. So it's interesting to me that did you guys ever wear that uniform in the jungle? Never. Wow. Some guys <laughs> did, but not our team. Not, not you guys' team. At that time in 68, the uh, camouflage fatigues, like that version there, I think, is the version that's too thick. Yeah. When it got wet, it would take a long time to dry. You get crotch rot, crotch rot. Yeah, yeah. Others were too thin. You get hit with a, a razor wire or, or not a wire, but, uh, yeah. you know, in the jungle. Yeah, the foliage would just rip your pants it off. It would. Yeah. It would just tear them up. Yeah. But the regular issue fatigues is what we wore were sturdier and they would generally hand up, hang in there much, much tougher. Oh, I like that. Yeah, I, I've experienced that myself with different types of uniforms. That's interesting, though, that you guys didn't wear that because that's that's uh, legacy history is known as being the desired camo for all the cool guys, right? Like the video games right. demonstrate that. But I can even see on the cover of your book, this is we're on a, a, a coffee or die um, their their segment of Black Rifle Coffee's uh, magazine, which was this was for an article, but your book Across the Fence in that picture on the front, you guys are wearing those OG olive drab fatigues, right. right? And that is that picture was taken right before we got on the helicopter for an insertion into a mission. So that is the way we went on a mission. Wow! And you're on That's the far, you're far right. I see you. On far the right. Yeah. Yes, sir. So, um, on your webbing, your web gear, right? Did, did you guys have Alice clips? To clip gear, or did you use, um, did you use like 550 cords to tie the, the the loops, or how was it attached? Mostly, there were already clips in this. This was a, a BAR harness. Okay, that's what we preferred to use. So the BAR harness had this extra area we could clip things in and then tape them down. Got it. So the hand grenades would be up here. Yeah. And um, because we had come back from a mission, I just threw a couple extra hand grenades on, and even my uh, K bar is not there. Because um, for I forget what the reason would be now, but it was off. Yeah, you could see but it right always, here in the picture on the book. Is that your cable right here? No, that would be uh, back then. That was my. Uh, we had a sog knife then. And then, yeah. then I, I had a mission where I passed out, and when I passed out in, in the elephant grass, they they uh, the guy that came to pick me up took off my web gear with my sog knife, my car fifteen. It's still in Leos. Wait, you passed out like you went to sleep. No, no, we were hanging upside down from a helicopter. Oh, <laughs> and the gear, my gear came down and choked me out. Really? And right before I passed out, unfortunately, Henry King, who was on the helicopter with me, could see me upside down. And we started at five thousand feet, and they, and they descended. I wasn't aware of it. Yeah. And when I passed out, I thought I felt elephant grass, which it was. Yeah. And so I fell like. 10, so you guys were infiltrating feet. using. Uh, we were repelled in. I got picked up and pulled out because the mission was compromised. There were enemy in this area. Yeah. And so when we're flying back, um, I got. I didn't have time to hook in. See the D ring up here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're supposed to hook into that. Yeah. Well, I was firing on the way out, and then I got bounced off the trees. <laughs> you know how it is when you get Jesus. pulled out, you get you become a well, human I don't know pinball. how to get pulled out, being extracted in the middle of a gunfight, but it's like. If you're a Mac V saw guy, then you for sure know that. Just, That's another, just another day in Just Sog, another Mike. day, man. Yeah. It's no big deal. <laughs> so um, eventually I got I got buffeted and got turned upside down. So I had the Swiss seat on. Yeah. The Swiss seat went down on my knees. I had my legs spread like a New York City hooker. Mm. And then uh, all, my, all the equipment came down. My web gear and, and it my choked backpack. You out. Blood choked you. Literally choked me out. So when he recognized that, he kind of they they told the helicopter to, go, to bring it down yeah. so they can get you squared away. And I wasn't aware of that because at that point I was just struggling to breathe. Oh and then then the web the uh, Swiss seat went down on my feet. My feet were spread. You could have fell out of the harness. Right? Yeah. Well, that, that's, that's, that's happened I, before, right? I, <laughs> yes, we had lost men that way. Well, crazy. Yeah. And crazy. so. I had my life flash before my eyes, and I saw the headline saying, 
local boy dies in Vietnam. I said, son of a bitch, they're lying. I died in Laos. No shit. Yeah. That's crazy, man. It was. Let's talk, let's talk about your weapon system finally. You, oh, yeah. You're running a CAR-15 right there, right? Always. My, my favorite. So it's interesting because you always hear this controversy that the early CAR-15s or the M-16s in Vietnam, they had issues. But I talked to you offline before, and you said that it was the weapon of choice for, for everybody for SOG. in SOG. Yeah. Right. And the... The issues you're talking about were from the early M16s. Yeah. When they first brought them in, the purchasing system purchased rounds with a gun pattern that was not recommended by the manufacturer. The typical army purchasing. Oh yeah. So they Shit get show. the wrong gun pattern. Yeah. And there's that's we lost our, our Marines and Army guys in the early days who malfunctioned with the M16. Yeah. By the time I get there in '68, the ammo thing was squared out at least for squared away with us yeah so we had the car 15 was a, which is basically a smaller version of the m16 with a classable stock shorter barrel more uh easily maneuverable in the jungle 30 round magazine never how many i, I never had just 20 just 20s right they See, didn't I have 30s now john plaster and some of the guys at ccc were smart enough to write the colt say hey we heard you had 30 round i want to buy three or four now we didn't know that and we were just too busy running missions anyway. Yeah. <laughs> John was busy writing books. Just kidding, John. No, John ran Maybe. many missions. He's he, a great, great dude. Oh, yeah. Um, when when uh, you're running the 20-rounders there, how many magazines would you carry on your kit? Uh, whatever it took to get more than 600 rounds. Wow. Okay. Yeah. By the end, we always carry 600 plus. That was the base load. Yeah. Plus the uh, 10 to 12 rounds for the M79 and then 10 to 12 hand grenades. Wow, 10 to 12 grand. Grams. And I carried the radio so I could direct the, the airstrikes. Yeah, a lot of people um, who make sure you understand this, um, there's a difference between reconnaissance units, like the Studies and Observation Group, and other military units. The idea is not to sustain a gunfight and stay in it. It's break contact because you guys aren't running into formidable foes. You're running into like battalion size element like large size elements right right by the by 1968 and 69 the nva had put together sapper units that were designed to track us in laos to kill the americans and leave the indigenous alive for psyops wow and by 1970 they had two battalions uh that were trained up just for that purpose in laos alone cambodia too because they knew you were around but they just oh, didn't yeah. know where you were and the key thing was it was that element of time where we got on the ground it took them to react to us. Yeah. And so we've had, like with Lynn Black on October 5th, 68, nine man team came up against a 10,000 man NVA unit. Yeah. And that's where they inflicted 90% casualties on the NVA between the recon team and the air support. Yeah. Between A1 Sky Raiders, helicopter gunships, and uh, Air Force fast movers. Wow. And the way we know that, Lynn talked to the NVA general that ambushed his team. Wow. That's and how that, he figured out how many casualties they took. Yeah, that's how he knew. Wow. And he told me they inflicted 90% casualties that day. That's crazy. Here's the kicker. The general goes, who was the guy standing there shooting? Lynn Black goes, that was me. Because when the initial firefight started, it was an L-shaped ambush they walked into. Yeah. They had a new team leader who violated the first rule and walked down the trail. Yeah. He walked into an L-shaped ambush and died to pay, pay the price. Wow. So Lynn goes, that was me. The general goes, you shot me three times. Wow. Yeah. The general was shot three times? Yeah, Lynn Black shot. says, could I interview him for the book, for the story in the book of her across the fence? Yeah. <laughs> Lynn goes, yeah, you know, a couple of times. I remember shooting these guys. They'd spin around. They didn't go down right away. I had to shoot them two or three times. Well, one of them, the guy was a colonel at the time of the oh, attack. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But when he interviewed Lynn, he was a th like a high-ranking general in the NVA Army. He's like, you shot me three times. Yeah. That's insane. Can you imagine? That's crazy. <laughs> and so, so right from the mouth of the generals, we can't refute that. Yeah, that's insane. <laughs> well, I, 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 you know, I don't think I, I'll ever sit down with AQ operatives, but that war was very different. That was a very different war in the jungle of uh, Vietnam. And, and... The, just the, the people who don't understand the complexities of that history of that war, MACV SOG was doing a lot of cross border operations. You guys were under like a, what, 30 year NDA or something like that? It 20. 20 year NDA. Yes, sir. And so 
um, you guys are crossing borders into Laos and Cambodia, right? Correct. And then for pilot rescues, wiretaps, POW snatches, yeah. uh, bomb damage assessments, point recon, area recon. Yeah. Basically, the action arm for the CIA to be used as a uh, an action force or, or a direct action force, we but also for reconnaissance, right? For intel. Right. Uh, we worked with the CIA, and the reason why MACV SOG was formed in 1964 is because CIA turned over that part of their of their action arm to the Army, to Special Forces. Mm. And I don't understand a lot of politics of that, but that's where MACV SOG started for yeah. eight years till 1972. Wow. And then after 1972, it, it never came back. Correct. Wow. Yeah, I know um, when I was in Afghanistan, my first rotation, we wanted to... I mean, the, the history of MACV SOG, especially for modern Green Berets and my peer group, were influenced by you guys. And so everything from the kit to the stories, it all inspired that generation to serve. And I remember uh, even the way we were planning operations and reconnaissance, we were reading some lessons learned from Mac V Sog <laughs> missions, which is crazy. You ran for Soldier of Fortune magazine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's crazy. It's so insane. Um, lastly, um, how long were you in country after this picture was was taken? How long did you operate I was, this particular That was trip? in the middle of my tour of duty. My first tour was April, late April 68 to late April 69. Yeah. Went home for five months with 10th Group, came back, got on the team again. Lynn Black was the one zero. Then we swapped a couple times. Then Lynn went uh, to, on a special operations off the team, and I took over the team. And I was there until April of 1970. Wow, wow, that's a long time in Vietnam. 19 man. months, yeah. That's a long time. Yeah, that's crazy, man. Well, John, tell me about lastly this book uh, across the fence since it's in front of us. You have three books, but let's focus on this one across the fence. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, book. that's the first book and. Uh, the ways in why it got out there at the time I started to write that my wife says you gotta write the book we had four teenagers and a newborn in the house wow and my wife goes you gotta write this for our kids yeah I started right there in the living room put a little desk up started writing interviewing guys really and cool. it came out in uh, 2003 and then we did the expanded edition where we ended 50 fo added, added 50 photographs and three more new stories and then we expanded one on what we carried, what we didn't carry. Wow, man. And that book is available on Amazon. Amazon. On Amazon. And then you have a, a Jocko uh, who's who's very gracious in, in helping you with the media side. You started Sawcast. You right? already have. And that's, again, thanks to, to Jocko Productions. I mean, he, uh, he liked our story. I've done a total of eight interviews with Jocko. Yeah. On his podcast. Yeah. And... Uh, as we were going down the last couple, I said, you should talk to this guy, talk to this guy, giving him people to interview. Yeah. Because Jocko's got so many different people he brings in. Everything yeah, yeah. from Holocaust survivors to Navy SEALs, Johnny Kim, mm -hmm. amazing stuff. Mm -hmm. And he goes, let's do Sawcast. And I go, sure, let's do it. He said, but you're going to do it. <laughs> I yeah. go, oh, okay. And he goes, I'll pay for it. And he wow. has. Wow. And so right now, as of today... Which is February twenty fifth, my daughter's birthday. I might add, happy birthday, indeed, Amazing. Meredith. Yes, yeah, she's the she's the proud mom of two of our grandchildren. Awesome. And uh, so we've um, we've got twenty two audios that have been uh, recorded. Seventeen of the audio podcasts are now on uh, Spotify, Apple, and then Echo is beginning to come out with the YouTube versions. Oh, nice. So we have the first three of those have been out. So SOGCAST uh, number 001, which is now we have over 145,000 views on that. Wow. That's and a lot. That's been out for a few months. Yeah. And so, yeah, oh, it's amazing. And people, I, almost every day I get notes back from folks um, saying that they've seen the stock stories they never knew. And they like the stock stories. And we've got guys that are now in special forces. In fact, we had a Special Forces graduation last week at Bragg. I was there with a young sergeant who uh, read across the fence four years ago. His aunt called me up and said, hey, my uh, my nephew wants to become a Green Beret someday. So we chatted, told him to go online. He saw one of your podcasts hmm. where you told what you did to get through 
and that helped him to get through the really ch- yeah the prequal that's so and awesome. the qualification course yeah and he graduated he graduated is a proud member of the 20 special forces group now he's getting ready to uh as soon as he gets back well, he's got to do language of course yeah 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 and he wraps up his language training he'll be um going to 20th and then they'll be might be deploying right away that's crazy man I but love, he I love he told it. me to personally thank you because really yeah he saw your one you did on the pre-qualification and what you did personally to get yeah. ready for the to go through the qualification course that's amazing man i love so, hearing the story about the saw cast i love i love that full circle like it's almost like we're two different generations influencing younger green berets to get up and just get after it you know i love that well in the early days when uh I started doing s- stories for Soldier of Fortune. I had a Nome de Gere, Yeah. Which was Isaac's thoughts. Yeah. Because if my newspaper that I was working at the time knew I was writing for Soldier of Fortune, they would have canned my ass in a New York City second. <laughs> so I had a Nome de Gere, wrote for them. And now I bore you with that to say, now that we're doing these podcasts, people come up and say, hey, you know, I didn't know you were Isaac's thoughts. Really? Yeah. Because you're inspiring a whole generation yeah. in a pseudonym. In a, in a, right. In a, and then the book came out. There are other guys that have joined Special Forces and other people have just said, I want to serve based off the book. That's so amazing. So that's, I yes, love that. Yeah. It is. It's very heartwarming. Yeah. It really is. Well, thanks, John. Thanks for, for being uh, with me today. We did a podcast for Phil Craft Survival with Kevin Estella. And we got more content to do. But thanks for sharing that information. Oh, absolutely. Us. Yeah. Hey, guys, go, go to the links below. And see all the links and get involved. Listen to the Sawcast because we'll have that link below. We'll have John Stryker Meyer's book, Across the Fence, and the other ones uh, as well. And make sure you stay tuned because all this content is rolling out. And that's history, man. You want to be inspired? Listen to the guys from the Studies and Observation Group. It's it's insane. It's it's what uh, between John Stryker Meyer, John Plaster, and all these guys that served, it's what motivated me to get off my ass and, and serve the country. And don't forget, when you got off your ass and you served your country with valor, as you did in many other Green Berets of this 20-year war, you took it to the next level, and I salute you for that. Thank you so much, John. That means a lot to me, man. My favorite coin, by the way, is a coin that John Streckermeyer gave me. <laughs> um, that's my favorite, I got, and I got many of them. But uh, yeah, stay tuned, guys. We're going to have more content. I appreciate you guys. Until next time. Later. Airborne. Airborne.